manager with Facebook. If I'm not mistaken, uh, you're dealing with, you're, you're working on Facebook connectivity. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So uh, I'm sure you can, uh, you can tell us a bit more about that. Uh, and what, what everybody's, I know everybody's interested to hear is uh, how you've been tackling product market fit, uh, this, this elusive state that all uh, startups and ventures uh, try to achieve. Yeah, I'm more than happy to. Um, so great to meet everyone. I was in Belgrade, what was it now? More in December, that's how I met Anna, was introduced to the community. I spoke at Started, the accelerator. All right. Yeah, so that was a really awesome experience and just getting to learn about some of the companies that are coming out of Serbia, a lot of the gaming companies was really exciting. So I'm excited to learn from you guys as well. So let's keep this interactive. There's only 18 people as for now. So it warners one of those round table discussions. I will share a, uh, yeah, Alex, did you have something to say? Yeah, thanks. So uh, yeah, to, to keep it interactive and to keep it uh, a semblance of structure. Uh, so if you have questions, I know I'll have some questions, please leave them in the chat window. Uh, I'll monitor those and uh, Diana, if there's anything there that, that makes sense to interject in your, I know you have a few slides for us. Uh, so I'll either jump in with those questions, or if not, uh, we can leave them for Q&A, uh, which we hopefully will have like half an hour for. I know our time is limited, uh, but uh, we'll try to keep it to the mm -hmm. point. No worries. The only thing I have to get back to is work. It's uh, <laughs> 30 here in the morning. Mm -hmm. So my boss is going to be calling at the end of the hour. Awesome. So let me share my screen. I'll go through the presentation and would love your guys' questions. Share screen. Doo, doo, doo. And I whipped these slides up this week, so they are not pretty, but hopefully they're informational. Let me, how do I present? All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about hacking, what I call hacking product market fit. I'll go through some Facebook examples, but I also talk about examples from the industry in Silicon Valley. Okay, so we talked about who I am, the agenda for today. One, why does product, product market fit matter? Two, has your startup found product market fit? And three, how to get closer to product market fit. This was initially made for people that are startup founders. And hence some of the stuff you'll hear me refer to is less, less focused towards existing medium-sized, larger comp companies. But we still have to go to the process of finding product market fit every time we develop a new feature. So still should be relevant. Okay, so why does product market fit matter? So it matters because it's the top reason why startups fail in the first place. And this comes from CB Insights, which is a large aggregator, aggregator where they interviewed about, what was it, 900 startups to understand why they failed in the first place. And it was because of no product market fit, no market need. And it also contributes what I would say to the second reason why startups fail. So why do startups run out of cash? When was the last time you heard a startup saying, oh, we're doing really well, we're getting a lot of traction in terms of users, but there are no investors willing to fund us? Almost never, it's rare. So hence a big reason why startups run out of cash is because they're iterating, iterating, and unable to find that fit that is taking them the traction. So I'd say the main two reasons of why startups fail is still because of product market fit. And you hear this from seasoned investors that they actually say the market and the users is really and for first and foremost important. For example, Don Valentine, who is the founder of Sequoia Capital in the Bay Area, he says he looks for the market that there's a market need first and then invests in a bunch of companies building to tackle that market. And Benchmark Capital, which was co-founded by a guy named Andy Ratcliffe, he says, you can have okay founders, okay technology, but if there's a huge market, it opens to something magical. And Andreessen Horowitz, as you guys might know, another huge VC here that invested in the Facebooks, the PayPals, et cetera, uh, had a similar mandate. So we know product market fit is really important because we get, we're get we getting signal from all these VC firms in the Bay Area that this is something significant. 
Okay, moving on. All right, so I'm curious if everyone, anyone has heard of these products. So bourbon is, and these are all US-based products, so that might be a reason why you guys have not heard of it. Bourbon was a product where you were able to check in into places that you went to, and this was founded in something like 2008. And Game Never Ending is similar to Sims, if any of you guys have played, and same with Glitch. So I'm assuming that most of you guys have not heard of these startups. And why? Mainly because they didn't have product market fit, so they failed. But have you guys heard of these companies? Instagram, Flickr, Slack, obviously. The tie-in here was that the founders of these companies were the same founders as, as these companies. So for Instagram, it was Kevin Sistrom. For Flickr and Slack, it is, why am I blanking out on his name? <laughs> the Canadian guy. But basically, they were able to take something that didn't have product market fit, zoomed into things that were getting a lot of traction on those previous products, and building it out into what are these really successful products today. So the story with Bourbon on the left here, they weren't seeing traction in their main functionality of people checking in, but they noticed that a lot of people were photo sharing, were uploading photos, and that was what led Kevin Sistrom to turn it into Instagram, where it was a photo sharing app that had the filters as the main way to beautify photos. Game Never Ending was a multiplayer game. Again, not getting much traction or users, but for the users that were on the platform, he was seeing, oh, Butterfield is his last name, Stuart Butterfield, now I just remembered. He was seeing him and his wife at the time, Catherine uh, Fake, Katerina Fake, were seeing a lot of people also doing photo sharing, uploading photos, and that's when he turned it into Flickr and saw a ton of more traction there. And with Glitch, which was the other company, he tried gaming the second time and still didn't go well. But at the time when he was working on Glitch, internally they developed a chat system for to communicate within their team. It was initially trying to use uh, the IRC protocol of chat, but then they turned it and they realized, wow, it's working really well for us. Can we turn this into an enterprise product? So the TLDR years pivot into product market fit. You can find inspiration from your existing failures and turn it into something amazing and great. And these founders have done that. So the question to yourself and your product or your startup or your feature that you're working with, I know a bunch of you guys are product managers, so probably working at the feature level and the product level versus starting something, uh, starting a startup. So the two main questions you I would ask myself if my feature product has start product market fit is one, what are users doing? And two, what are users saying? So this is measuring two dimensions. One dimension is the behavioral element of, of observing are people showing that they really like this product. And the second one is the more self-reported feedback, which I would say is less lesser fidelity. Um, Alex has studied psychology and we know there's a huge gap between what we say we want to do and what we end up doing. So hence the first one on behavioral has much more fidelity and trust. Yeah, actually, uh... We, we, we had a meetup uh, around that, around uh, what you're, how to take feedback and how to do product discovery in a meaningful way without, uh, without people inadvertently lying to you, actually. So uh, if I can interject here, as I did, uh, are there any specific metrics uh, that you would uh, point out to, to, to track these two dim dimensions, what are users doing and saying? So that's a great lead into the rest of the press to the rest couple of slides. Okay. So the first one we talked about, what are users doing? And the main things you're trying to evaluate is obviously growth. So adoption, second one, are users retaining? Third, are users, whether it's clicking or you know, doing something in the application and the product that is meaningful for your, your company. And the fourth one is are people voting with their wallets, is what I like to call it. And I'll go in through specific metrics. So at Facebook, the main key metrics for growth 
are one, monthly active users. Internally, we call it MAP, monthly active people. We replace users with people to make it more human. <laughs> but nowadays, we're actually focused on daily active people instead of month monthly active. Daily because the folks that are using Facebook, and it is a really high number on a daily basis, are the ones we want to track and also bring them from becoming monthly active users to daily active users. A second port for startups particularly, when they're growing, we want to know the percentage of organic signups. You can have a ton of people adopting your product, but if that's all paid marketing, your business is not going to be very sustainable. So evaluating what is that portion of signups that are coming from either word of mouth, which is the second portion, referrals per user, either word of mouth, or they did a Google search and they found it organically, or they heard it from groups like Reddit, like Quora. So that organic signup is going to be key to helping you find sustainability. So some examples of growth. So the first one is obviously growth that isn't sustainable or very good. And the example here is Frontier Frontierville, which was created by Zynga. Zynga is infamous for creating these games that have a ton of engagement, monetization, but some of them failed and Frontierville was one of them where they did some growth marketing, growth hacking on it and it got users, got really high users. Sorry, let me pause. My music started playing all of a sudden. Uh, hey portal, pause. <laughs> okay. Okay, so got a ton of users and there was a spike but over time you'll see across years that number plummeted and that's kind of telling you first sign it doesn't really have a ton of product market fit on the right side is what we want to see what we called an angle change in the shift of adoption and this was for a mobile company where you'll see at the very bottom you can't even see it there's numbers and then all of a sudden it starts taking off and it has this angle shift all the right up to the right. And some of this is what people like to, in Silicon Valley call the hockey stick and the sort of model to go forward. But you'll see on the left-hand side where it's pr pretty flat, there is that journey of finding product market fit that requires iteration after iteration until you get the right set of features to get scale. So I want to emphasize here, sometimes there could be one element of your product that has a lot of traction, but some other elements that don't. So it's almost, you're playing around to find the right combination to get a ton of users. It's not just, and sometimes it could just be one feature, um, but don't be discouraged if there are certain features that are not really taking off, or it seems like the comprehensive product isn't really taking off. The second portion I'll go into retention. For people who have studied product market fit, they probably look at this first. And within Facebook, this is the uh, aspect we look at to give us early sign, is there product market fit or do we need to go? This gives us the first sign whether we need to reiterate on the product or two, we need to start growth marketing efforts. So if it has product market fit, it's the line on the blue line product, product a where it's flattening out and for most products even the ones we work on in facebook it's not at 50 percent. some of that is at 15 percent. but as long as it flattens out even 15 percent is showing us that there's some promise and we would push forward at such low numbers and we know that what it requires is just some tinkering within the product to figure out whether we need to help people discover a certain feature that we think can bring that 15% to 20%, 30%, or there might be an element of we have to redesign the feature a bit to make it more usable, because sometimes there's usability issues. But as long as there is that retention, even if it's a low rate, it, it's a good sign. The alternative is product B, the green line, where it continues to shoot down and you hit zero after a certain amount of time. and we see for our products, even over a year, for the ones that have product market fit, they don't hit zero. They can hit something like 3%, 5%, but that's still telling us that 
in the short term, we're able to get users to engage and that we can start then iterating to help increase that long-term re low retention rate of three to 5% to, to something like 10%. So what you don't want is it going down to zero. And I also want to point it here, sometimes a lot of the early signs come from early adopters. And you might see something different when you release it out to the mass consumers, where it might go down less than 50%. Because of its mass consumers, you see something at 25%. And that's totally normal. Did you have a okay? Awesome. And the numbers you want to measure it at is what we do within Facebook is uh, seven and 28 day retention rates. Next part, engagement to so the two metrics here. I look at, or I, as in we, as a company, look at the ratio between daily active users and monthly active users to tell us how high that engagement rate is amongst the cohorts. The second thing I hear generic number of activity X per user. So you as a company have to, whether it's the team level or the company level, have to figure out what is that activity that your users are engaging on that is the most valuable for them and also you. For example, we launched a new product in Facebook called Facebook called Rooms. And it's kind of like house party, if you guys know of it. And there yeah. we're asking ourselves, yeah? Yeah, I said yes, yeah, sorry. Awesome. It's, and there, while as a product team, we're thinking, asking ourselves, what is the intersection of what's the most valuable for the user and for us? And that metric might be the number of rooms joined per user per day. If it's a, if it's Netflix, they would look at the number of shows watched per user per day. But for videos, they're usually measuring time. So I know Netflix's top metric is like number of hours watched per user per week, probably. So understanding what is that key activity that is meaningful for you as a company and for the user and that intersection and that marriage is what will help your company and feature get traction. So that's like a, that, that, that's like a golden nugget uh, in all of these metrics. So uh, can you maybe uh, 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 around that, uh, do you have any like, a, apart from those two specific, I, I, I don't expect you have a step-by-step a, a -step guide how to get to that one key metric because I agree it usually is one or two key things that you track. So is it, how do you get to that usually? Is it like by consensus inside the team or do you also mm -hmm. uh, invite users into that conversation? Yeah, that's a good question. It's mostly within the team we have to hypothesize, but it is an iterative process. For example, in our connectivity team, uh, our key metric is net new internet users online. And then we had a UX researcher go on the ground and he was saying in a lot of these rural areas, there's already a ton of people that are using Facebook and that might not be the most useful signifier to tell a success, but instead we should be measuring things like number of hours spent on Facebook because for a lot of these net new internet users, they're not spending a lot of time, but if we see the increase in time, it can then lead them to tell their other family members who are not using the internet to spend more time. Right. So we decided to focus on this metric that's actually easier to measure than net new internet users. So sometimes it could be a feasibility thing. You can't measure everything. We wish we can event log everything, but we can't, especially offline activity. Sure. Makes sense. Uh, Mihailo was also wondering uh, what benchmarks do you use for the metrics? Uh, what do you compare against? Do you use uh, like averages or do you set your own? Yeah, I have a benchmark section. Uh, remind me that question when we get to that in like five minutes. Cause we'll do, we'll do. Okay, so that's the engagement piece. The last one is monetization, which I put right after engagement because it's intimately tied. So for example, Netflix, the more people that are, well, 
I guess they don't have a model where the more hours you're watching, the more money they're getting because it's a subscription model. But there are some products, the more you do something of X, that activity, the more money you're getting. So within Facebook, the more ads people, a business is advertising and more budget they put, and the, that's the activity, uh, advertising, the more it's translating to monetization. And the key metrics there, measuring average revenue per paying user, because there are some products that are have a freemium model where there's the non-paying and then the paying user paying portion a percentage of paying users so for example spotify model what percentage of those users are still using ads like myself <laughs> versus those who decided to move on to subscription and getting a healthy ratio there which i, I wouldn't even know what the benchmark is but you probably would want to see it increasing over time and then cost of acquisition must be lower than lifetime value so this is important and it gets ties into what I said earlier about percentage of organic growth. So there will come to a time where it makes sense to spend money on acquiring new users over Google ads or Facebook ads or et cetera. But you want to make sure that cost is lower than what that user is spending on your platform over time, obviously. Otherwise, it's not a sustainable business. And this is coming straight from when you go into a VC pitch or an investor pitch, they're going to be asking you that. Because not only do they want to see you're getting a ton of users, getting a ton of traction, but this is done at a sustainable rate where the company's not going to blow up and um, have such high costs that the profit margin is going to be nil or even negative. And lastly is renewal rate. For a consumer company, it's obviously... Uh, I use a product called FitOn, which is a fitness app, and subscribe to it per year. So next year, are these people subscribing over and over? For a SaaS company, this is if people have an enterprise contract, are they renewing year to year, and is that amount growing? Because sometimes with a new renewal contract, they renegotiate either for a lower cost or re renegotiate for uh, new features, more support, and that ends up being a higher revenue towards the company. Okay, the benchmarks. So for the consumer products, and this comes from a growth marketer called Andrew Chen. So this is a direct copy and paste, but I thought it was really useful and hopeful. The first one, he said daily active users, monthly active users, the ratio should be more than 25%. And what is my view on this? I'm trying to benchmark it across our products. It really depends. If your product is an insurance company, it might be lower than 25% because how often are people buying insurance? If it is a content company where people go to to read news, to catch up with friends, the Twitters, the maybe less LinkedIn, but Twitter, it would be closer to 25% and more. Second one, organic growth of hundreds of signups per day, according to Andrew Chen, and this is probably in the beginning of a startup, obviously, if you're at Facebook level, we see more than hundreds. Third one, 30% of users are active the day after sign up. So this goes to the retention aspect that on the first day of sign up, obviously you have 100%. And then the second day, if people are still thinking about your product, and if 30% of those users are still thinking about your product, that's a good sign. But obviously, if within 28 days that goes to zero, still bad but the after second days, uh, after, after the sign up day is a good sign. And then lastly, clear path to 100,000 users. This is again, focused towards a startup and that might be not that ambitious if you're already at like a million users. And before I go to the next one uh, on the SaaS side, because some of you guys is, might be B2B businesses, how we do benchmarking within Facebook. So one, we look at historical trends. For example, if we're building a new feature on Messenger, we would look at how, sorry, if we're building a feature on top of like an existing product, we would look at how that product has grown over the last, like six months, one year, two year, 
and compare it and say, okay, then we expect in the future that we're going to add one or two percentage points and expect it to grow at, at that rate, given we have X, Y, Z resources. So for example, we have more, if we have 10 more engineers than we did last time, I'm going to add additional percentage points to that. If we have more projects this half versus last half, I'm going to add a couple percentages uh, to that. That's usually how we do projections when we communicate goals to our leadership, which we do a lot of. It's, it's funny, I, and I'm so surprised how good of a science we've got this down to. But at every half, which is how often we do the planning, so every six months, we have our data scientists come in and project that in this half, our goal is to hit this number of adoption or transaction, whatever that top line North Star metric is. And over the half, we're just tracking like, oh, we're you know 10% away from that, from that goal or 5% away. And sometimes we don't hit it, but that goal is really important to, for people to march forward towards. Okay, so on the SaaS side, the B2B, Andrew Chen says 5% of people converting from free to paid version, which seems kind of low, but cost of acquisition should be three times. No, no, I think I mix it around. Is this right? LTV should be three times. No, that's right. The cost of acquisition. So for example, if uh, we have here the internet service provider Comcast, which in a year I'm paying, what is it? Let's say 70 times 12, whatever that number is. Let's make it easy, six, six times 12, 72. So $7,200. So they would want to have a third of that be what it took to acquire me, which is still a pretty, pretty high amount. And they are doing these things. And that's why these companies are able to do these things where they pay for your you breaking your contract with the un, another internet service provider so this gives you a good benchmark how much you can afford to pay for cost of acquisition and sometimes that could be pretty high for example when i was working at google the ads for lawyers that were battling or helping people fight cases for like a very specific type of disease each of those costs for, per clicks were something like 50 to hundred dollars, but that's because what that translated into a deal, a signed deal tr amounted to tens of thousands of dollars or more. Okay, less than 2% monthly churn rate and then clear path to hundred thousand dollars monthly recurring revenue. Uh, and these all resonate because within Facebook, for example, we have uh, the workplace product which is our enterprise product of people using Facebook for work. Yes, that sounds very uh, glorified to have Facebook at work. And we track things like annual revenue, recurring revenue as our main top line metric. Okay, I'm gonna go on. So this again was targeted towards startup. What are tools? Obviously Google Analytics, Mixpanel is another good one. And if you guys haven't heard of segment.io, they pull your data across multiple channels so that you have it in one place. So kind of similar to HubSpot, but goes beyond just media, uh, goes beyond just social media. So we moved from the behavioral portion that are, what are users doing? And I talked a bit about measuring those metrics, which I would say at the, are the highest fidelity. But there is some value in understanding what our users saying, especially when you're a startup really early on or a feature that's built really early on and when you don't have a lot of actual numbers or not users. First thing I caveat here is making sure to target your users when you get feedback. So people tend to go across the gamut and interview ev anyone who's willing to talk to them, but that's not the smartest idea. For example, if you're trying to understand why people are churning, go interview the people that are churning off your platform. Things you want to understand, so surveys, NPS score, people talk about all the time, but this is coming even from the Silicon Valley investors. So Andy Ratcliffe, who started Benchmark Capital, 
says that ideally you would have a NPS score greater than 40, which is a good sign, which I still think is kind of low. Uh, user research side is also really meaningful to so doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, but also user testing. There's a company in the Bay Area called usertesting.com, uh, and you serves that are using it might be aware, but it's really awesome because you're watching someone on their screen trying your product right there and then, and that observational ethnographic portion is just so valuable to get you to question the assumptions you have building the product. Okay, and again, this was initially geared towards startups. So the question, now the hard question for you to figure out is, has your startup or feature found product market fit? And really need people to be honest here. And I would say it's really hard to admit because when the answer is no, it almost feels like it's a failure. So I ask, okay, are you running from the truth and you don't have product market fit? but you're constantly trying to push in all angles and it's just not working. But the second aspect is you're almost there. You're really close. So I showed you the graph earlier of that product that had the angle shift and they spent a significant portion of their time. I think it was almost a year and they were almost, almost there. I'm obviously in the beginning, it probably didn't have product market fit, but almost there then turned into product market fit after a year. So figuring this out for yourself is really important, one, to be aware, but then to take the necessary steps to get closer to product market fit, which is what we'll talk about in the next section. So I say here, be honest because fail fast. That's a mantra we say at Facebook all the time. It's in posters that are plastered everywhere. And fail fast because Bourbon turned into Instagram because they decided to say, okay, this isn't working. Let's pivot to this other thing. Fail fast because game never ending is like, this is something I as a founder, I'm so excited about in building a game, but it's not turning into traction and it's just going to whittle down the morale of my team. So fail fast. Let me go switch on to uh, Flickr, which is a much more adopted product. Okay. So if you don't have product market fit either yet, or you're running from the truth again, I think the first step isn't to go throw the baby out of the bathwater is what we like to say in America, basically like give everything up. It's to scientifically ask yourself, where's the main problem more so? What is the root cause problem and a target there? So the first question is, do I have the right set of market and target users? And that's really evaluating beyond just the user that you focused on yourself, I'll go into actually more details before I go dive deep. The second one, am I solving the right pain point? And then the third one, does my product solve the pain point significantly better? So I'll go into each of these. Okay. Do I have the right market and target users? So here, what I would be looking at, if you're starting from the very like foundational aspect of it, I would say, is things like sizing the user segment that you're targeting, understanding who are the users versus buyers. So for example, if I'm selling a, a children's game, the buyers is going to be the parents, but the user is going to be the child. So you have to understand when you're marketing or building for that, you have that dichotomy to make sure you're doing it right. Early adopters versus mass consumers. So initial early adopters can get us really excited that this has a ton of traction, but when you then try to scale it to mass consumers, you might need to change some elements of your product in order to get more people to adopt it. So understanding those dichotomies, dichotomies will get, just give you more clarity and like, who am I building for right now in the short term versus who am I building for the long term and how do I develop the right roadmaps to customize it towards short term versus long term. A second portion, beyond just the users of who they are, understanding their income and disposable income specifically. For example, in emerging markets, the volume of people is massive. In India, 1.5 billion people, right? But if I wanna be a company that's with a goal of generating $2 billion of revenue within two years, 
I don't know if that's going to come from India if you're focusing on the bottom of the pyramid. So you're going to have to map out for the customers that you are targeting their disposable income. If they're earning $5,000 in a month, like how, what percentage of that will they actually be able to use to pay for a portion of, to be able to pay for your product? Uh, three competitor mark market shares. If there's one big monopoly right now, that might be really hard for your company or startup. Well, depending to try to get, you know, 1% of that market share. However, it is ideal if you're in a market where it's highly fragmented, there are a bunch of users, a bunch of competitors and alternatives that don't have dominant market share because that's pretty much telling you there isn't one product that is solving that pain point really well and you have that opportunity to take that leadership to understand what are the problems of each of the existing products and what you can do to be 10 times better and to take like a more mo monopolistic market share. And the last one, is your market a growing or declining market? For example, I was working with a company in Botswana. They're working on a technology called USSD. I don't know if any of you guys know what that is, but that's similar to SMS and it's a precursor of internet access and it's a protocol where you're able to get some portions of internet, but anyways, it's going out of style and that startup is investing in USSD. And me as an investor, I would think to myself, okay, in five years down the line, is this technology still going to be relevant? It might still be relevant now and can grow a lot, but if that startup or your product doesn't have a more long-term vision of this is how we're going to transition from what we're doing now, which we know is a dying market to taking all the users we've adopted and then turning them into like paying users for this new service. Unless you have the ability to think of that long-term vision, most likely I wouldn't invest because I know that market's not doing great. Next portion, the second is, am I solving the right pain point? So here, the framework I like to think about is your product a vitamin or a painkiller? So it's a painkiller if you're solving something urgent and people need that problem fixed right there and then. And hence, even if your product isn't amazing, they will come to it because it solves what they need. If it's a vitamin, it still solves their problem, but that problem is not so urgent where people are willing to pay money for it today. For example, like climate change. For people to solve climate change, it's kind of like a vitamin because one, it might not affect us tremendously in our life, in our lifetime, but it might affect people down the line. And, you know, we have a very spend now versus save for later type of mindset. So thinking about that, that dichotomy of your product, and it doesn't mean that if your pr product is a vitamin, it's not going to succeed. You just have to think if it is a vitamin, be more realistic about when you expect users to convert to paying users and what you need to do to increase, to push the vitamin to get closer to a painkiller. So for example, on booking.com, it, it's not like an urgent process unless you're a business travel to book a hotel there and then. And hence people spend a lot of time shopping and a lot of times people go off the platform with them without buying anything. So what Booking did was really smart is they, one, tell you, oh, 10 other people are looking at this hotel right now and then. So that creates that urgency where there's a competition. And then two, they give a ticker, say, oh, pay, buy now or pay for this hotel room within the next two hours and you'll keep this rate. Otherwise, it might go up. So that's a tactic where a company that was solving a vitamin problem was able to bring it closer to a painkiller to create that sense of urgency. And how so, do you, un yeah, go ahead. Sorry for, for interjecting no, again. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we have like 15 more minutes. So I'll, I'll step in with a few questions. Uh, and, uh, I'm going so quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I feel like uh, time, time flies when you're having fun. So uh, even, and actually myself, we were both wondering, uh, a lot of these are, are, are 
awesome if you already have uh, a product uh, so you can measure uh, usage uh, and then there's a user date user base you addressed some of this but do you have any pointers uh, for new startups uh, maybe do you have any any tips on how to get at least in the direction of PMF uh, before building uh, and also even was wondering specifically uh, do you have a recommendation for uh, new startups uh, for for places to uh, actually get user paying for ads, which which as you said doesn't make too much sense before you actually nail PMF. Yeah. So okay. So the question, second question I got, the first question was for early users. How do they up figure figure out whether they can get early PMF? So the stories that I've heard that were inspiring, and it kind of touches this. Early on, you want to be as close to understanding what I call the user journey as possible. So the examples here I have like one-on-one -on -one interviews, be the users and go do it yourself, and then three shadowing users. And this came inspired from uh, the oh, DoorDash example. If you guys know DoorDash, it's food delivery within the US and it's gone really big, even trumping Grubhub, which was the company that existed before it. But what the founder, Tony Hsu, did early on when he wanted to understand the pain points was he, he went to go be a delivery man at uh, Pizza Hut. Yeah, Pizza Hut. And then after for a very long time, he was, him and his uh, C-suite team was doing the deliveries to understand the problems of the delivery of the small and medium business, but also of the users. And still to this day, every quarter, he makes sure to go be the one to deliver food to people and I think that's initially important too. Don't, when you think about product market fit, it really is being able to solve like the right pain point. And if you can be as close to the pain point and the users as possible by doing those things on your like daily uh, on a frequent basis, you're, you're going to get closer to that without seeing the numbers. Airbnb also had the example, Joe Gebbia, who is one of the co-founders early on, he realized that on the Airbnb platform, a ton of the uh, listings had terrible photos. So he's like, okay, well, let me go take the photos myself. And that was what opened the door for him to understanding what were the pain points on the existing product, but in the bigger ecosystem of what people you know, are fearful of to have a person in their home. So it's a create more of those experiences as you're an early startup to understand if the pain point is actually a pain point. Um, and then the second question on how do they, how do they get users? So I'll skip over to, oh, um, this portion, so testing demand, obviously. Okay, so one thing I've seen startups be tactical in getting users is posting on existing forums where you know your target user really cares about this thing. For example, if I'm developing a travel product, there's a group I'm part of called Girls Love Travel. And one, I can use this as uh, user research by asking questions because the community is very active. It doesn't say here, but yeah, 1.1 million members. So just a great way to get enthusiasts and early adopters to give you feedback. But two, recommending whatever product you have to say like, oh, this is something new that I saw. And you see this on Quora too. A lot of people answer questions because they are a thought leader in that space. But, oh, by the way, they also own the company that they just like proposed. And people have gotten really successful in getting uh, traction on these websites that have credibility. And people know that Reddit, uh, websites like Reddit come from like users themselves, very bottoms up. So they trust it. And hence, if you go in there, not just advertising, but saying like, this is how it's solving your problem for this very specific group of people, you usually get more uh, traction than if you were to blast it out on a Facebook ad. Cool. Were there any other questions? Let's go in question time. I know we have 10 minutes. Yeah, I know uh, you're expecting a, a call. <laughs> so uh, 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 thanks for this. Uh, this was really awesome. Uh, I think, uh, 
you addressed a lot of the my questions and questions from the crowd about pre-product really. Uh, so uh, one other thing we were wondering is uh, how do you actually differentiate between like a North Star metric or whatever you're tracking, retention, CTR, whatever, uh, being low dirt to poor execution, like bad UX or maybe bad copy or whatever, versus it not performing well because there's no, there's no interest, uh, there's no value for the user? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. There's, there's no North Star answer, actually. And it's funny because within Facebook, we always say... Some of the most successful products were products we tried before but failed. So sometimes it's execution, but it's also timing. Like that's another factor. Maybe at that time users were not ready for that product and when we shipped it, it, it didn't succeed. And that's why we constantly have to think about iteration when we think about product market fit. You know, there, and the process of getting the product market fit isn't this like one aha moment, one day you wake up with the right set of features but it's continuous across time. You know, I try this thing and it got me 1% of more users, but like that's still a success. Oh, I tried another thing another week later and it got 5%. So we always say within Facebook, it's, uh, what is it called? We make progress through that 1%, 1% increase to get to where we are today. That's not the case when you're early stage, because obviously when we first started, it was growing at like, you know, 100% per week. But over time, the wins become smaller the bigger you are and the more products you're launching. Um, so uh, execution between it really doesn't work isn't very clear cut. And do, 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 do. I think you just have to optimize for perfect execution every time to give you that signal. <laughs> right. Uh, so th th this kind of segues into the next one. Uh, Mark Andreessen, if I get if I pronounced it right this time, uh, he said uh, like if you need to ask if you have product market fit, then you don't have it. Like you know if you have product market fit, but I think uh, a lot of teams find themselves being almost there. So like making that decision, should I pivot? or persevere, should I drop this or try something else or just keep pushing? Maybe the timing's not right. Maybe I'm almost there. Maybe I just need to tweak this or that. So how do you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. It, there isn't a, unless you have the user behavior traction numbers to really back it up, you're always in this gray zone but there are times where you like know you don't, so that's clear cut. So for example, the segment founder, segment uh, CEO, Peter Reinhardt, he said initially before he started segment, they created a product for students to like raise their hand in a classroom when they didn't understand what the teacher was saying. And he's like, obviously this is solving a pain point for professors when they don't know their students aren't retaining something. And for users, it gives, gives them an opportunity to stop a professor. So, so verbally, it seemed like it was solving a pain point. But when he promoted this product in the classroom and got them to test it, he went to go watch the students in the back of the classroom to see if they were using this product. And all of these students, they were on Facebook, they were on Google and some other thing on their laptop. So that was when he sort of saw that there wasn't product market fit because people weren't using it at that time, even when the like value proposition was there. And I think at that time they said, oh, we, we don't have product market fit and it's gonna be hard to educate these users to like figure out, to get them to have traction within five, like five months, which was the time they had at Y Combinator. So they decided to make hard pivot and say, okay, what is that thing that users want urgently now, like so bad that it's gonna push us towards product market fit. And that's what ended up happening to their company. Product market fit found them. <laughs> and that's what you wanna experience. And sometimes we don't all have the luxury to experience that, but users are telling you what they want you to build. And when there's a massive amount of users uh, doing that, you're like pushed into product market fit. Oh, you're muted. 
yeah, here we go. Uh, so yeah, another thing, maybe, uh, maybe you can't really answer this, but uh, uh, you mentioned something around about small startups uh, versus uh, these, these big uh, tech companies that dominate the space right now. And as the markets kind of start to uh, get to a few bigger players, then there's a cycle where, again, uh, there's a bunch of specialized, smaller startups that kind of take chunks. So, uh, again, uh, looking at where you work, maybe this is not the best question for you, but uh, how, how does a small, scrappy startup which doesn't have the resources and the manpower maybe take a chunk out of a market of a large tech giant, let's say Google, not to say Facebook, you mentioned they need you need to be like ten times better at one thing. So I love the the analogy I point to is David and Goliath. If you guys know of that story where David being super small won against the giant. But that was because he was focusing on his main advantage. So the advantages that we don't see as a small startup is we can do really crazy things. And two, we don't have all this baggage of like having a board of directors and having to go through multiple chains of uh, VPs to get approval for something. So for example, the example, the story I heard yesterday, which was really inspiring was Michael Dell, who is the founder of Dell computers. And at that time, the main like computer manufacturer for personal computers was Apple and IBM. And within, I think it was like, two years, he was able to get as much demand as IBM. And that was because he was focused on solving the user problem and not obsessing over the competitors and saying like, how do we do better than them? So when you spend all of your time saying, okay, these are my target users. These are their general challenges. And these are the challenges they're facing, even with the existing solutions. Now, how do I build better for that? And that's actually Google, one of Google's mantra too. It's like, let's not be so obsessed with the competitor, which, you know, their main competitor is us. So they don't, they don't have that many. Um, let's focus on how do we deliver user value? And that was their story with Gmail as well. When they first entered into the market, Gmail in 2004, 2008, there were so many other email engines at the time, Yahoo, Hotmail, et cetera. And people were like, why are you investing in the space when it's so crowded already and those solutions already solve for what people need? And then they said that there's still challenges in this market with email because at that time, people had to every hundred emails delete a bunch of emails so they didn't get new ones. And they're like, okay, we're going to give each uh, email user one gigabyte now. So that's solving a huge user pain point. And after solving a couple of user, user pain points, as you guys know now, they're the dominant mail, like email provider, right? It took them time, but they were focused on the user first. All comes down to the user most of the time. So uh, we only have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, there's one more technical question about NPS and how you actually measure it. Uh, and if you can address that and maybe uh, we can use the, the what, whatever time we have left for you to add whatever you think is is important and we didn't touch upon. I should have posted this, but NPS is I think one question or two question. You might know this better, Alex. Uh, it's one. It's it's well, it's one plus the additional one, but the base is uh, on a scale to one one to ten. How likely you are to recommend this to your peer? Yeah, and then. And again, you might know this better because we don't measure so much NPS score. We have other stuff, but I know other small, small startups do. So, you know, I'll let you answer. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't like NPS. Uh, I think it's not very useful. I think it's only useful to measure very specific things and to measure increase or decrease in user satisfaction. But like my whole thing is I, I'm not, I'm, I'm all for ethnographic research. I'm all for actually for open-ended questions i'm all for actually seeing what the user does rather than asking them are you satisfied dissatisfied or mildly satisfied that's i don't think there's too much value in that that's totally fair and i like ex you touched on a really good point when we get metrics don't necessarily always use that as a signifier of like success or failure especially when you 
get their initial early measure, but use that as a benchmark. It's like, we're here now and then set a goal. It's like, okay, we want to get there in five years. And if we're trending towards positive, that's usually a good sign. Yeah. So, so it's like uh, measuring your, your performance against your yesterday's performance. Exactly. Like personal right. self growth, right? We want to improve more than we did yesterday. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So uh, even was also wondering uh, around uh, researching, uh, actually finding a, a market need, finding a problem worth solving. Uh, is that something? Uh, and a lot of people like to use like smoke tests uh, and actually start a small limited campaign to to kind of find people who are, are in that space, who are around that problem. So is that? Is that a venue uh, you also like to use or think that makes sense or versus uh, starting at, at, at some of the places you already mentioned like war and, and these uh, user forums? Yeah. I, if we're going for early adopters, I highly propose these forums because these are your early adopters. You know they're obsessed with this one thing already and hence you'll get much more traction to just try it. So for example, in some countries or in the Bay Area, like why we've gone successful is people are willing to try different technologies. But if you go to, I was in um, Bulgaria and I got, they said that like, we know we have this really great product, but the main gate from getting adoption is people are not like more, people are more risk averse and don't want to try new products. They're scared that it's going to take their money, even though it says free. So I would say going to go find your user group, your early adopters where they're really enthusiastic already and less risk averse will get you much more traction and signal on those early adopters versus broadcast. Like even broadcasting over Facebook, sure, we do a good job of targeting the users who could be interested. But I think here, not only do you get traction and conversion rate, but you get the qualitative piece that you won't get from a Facebook ad or a Google ad. Uh, even says thanks. Uh, so, uh, anything since I kind of cut you off, uh, is if you, oh if you have <laughs> no, we, yeah, it's been an hour. Uh, is there if, if you have more time, we would love to hear uh, from some more from you. Oof. I've uh, I have a 10 30 meeting, but three minutes we can spend, and I'll let, let, let me just let them know that I'm gonna be late. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Are there other, I guess, three minutes worth of questions? Oh, we're, uh, I think we're through with the questions. Uh, oh, I just okay. thought that if you have, uh, if you have anything you would like to add to what we already said. Sure. So we talked about, okay. So it was, I was here where I was talking about asking yourself, does your product act actually solve the pain point? And the two here, like what are today's alternative solutions? An example here was uh, TurboTax. So if you guys know, it's the product where we use digitally to fill out our taxes. And the CEO at the one time asked his, asked his employees, oh, what are, who are our competitors? And they were naming off other companies that were doing digital tax or TurboTax. And he was like, no, our biggest competitor right now is people fill filling out the tax like with a pen and paper. So I think really realizing what all the, are, are the alternative status quo solutions exhaustively that people are using now, because that helps you understand how much are people willing to go try something new. Maybe that alternative solution that exists today is good enough that they don't need to spend more time or money, but because filling out a tax form on pen and paper is pretty darn painful they are willing to use the digital solution um, and pay what for pay more money uh, to do that. And then is your solution 10 times better? So this is coming from the Google X philosophy that it's easier to build something 10 times better than it is to build something 10% better. 10 times better because you're given the sort of freedom to think a bit outside of the realm. And Astro Teller who, who leads Google X says, we, the products within the Moonshot products should be somewhere between a ambitious project and a science fiction novel idea. So here, 
challenge yourself. How can I be 10 X better than the competition or what exists status quo? And I think it'll get you faster to finding adoption from users. That's a great advice to, to, to finish up. Yeah. yeah. I'm end it there. Be 10 times better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for, for helping us become 10 times better than Facebook. At, le- at one specific thing. Uh, thanks so much, Diana. This, this has been awesome. Uh, I know you have places to be and people to talk to. So uh, I wish I could spend more time with you. It was a really great experience in Serbia and I enjoy meeting everyone. So. Me too. Me too. Uh, yeah, I'll be in touch and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to see you in person once all of this is uh, in the past. That'd be amazing. Thank you so much, Anna and Alex, for organizing this. And to everyone who's on the call, thanks for your guys' attention. And note, you guys are doing really admirable things in Serbia. So, Thanks for doing this. Enjoy your night. Bye. Bye.